Anika makes her way up to the, the floor. Uh, I'll just comment that on the surface, the first two um, presentations of the flag and star are from different contexts of engineering and war. And the titles, at least, offer very different perspectives. But we've already heard, I think, there are some connections to the sorts of things that might be happening in, in your work, Chris, and perhaps in the war. So we'll, we'll hand over to Anika and Anika Kels. Valuing self determination design. Yes, and I might not actually make the, the, the connections at this point that she wanted to away <laughs> from that. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, thank you everybody for having me. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that we're meeting on not all lands and to acknowledge the leaders, past, present, and future, um, that we can all continue to learn from. Um, first of all, Today, I'm just going to provide a brief overview of what self-determination theory is. I've been in this space examining this from different angles now for probably way too long. <laughs> so I take it as given that everybody understands what it is. So I'll try and give you a brief overview of that. Um, and how a person's progress towards values may interact with this theory. I'll also follow that by a brief explanation as to why these concepts may be important to wellbeing education and then to consider what aspects of a curriculum may provide the basis for students to improve their self-determination and values as they engage with their education. So firstly, let's just start with a quick overview of what self-determination theory is, and then we'll move on to the values part of that. So self-determination theory was elucidated by Ryan and Decky. I, every time I say Decky, I'm not sure if it's Decky or Desi, um, is a theory of motivation based on a person's basic psychological needs. In a 2000 art article, um, they've since released a, a beautiful book which covers all areas of theory, um, but this article sums up um, quite critically some of the bits about it that were um, easiest parts to understand, I guess. Human beings can be proactive or engaged, or alternatively passive and alienated, largely as a function of the social conditions in which they function. Um, so uh, just with those sort of key words of motivation and engagement um, and alienation and whether they're passive, that's where I'm coming at for why it might be relevant to education. So the self-determination theory states that the three innate psychological needs that facilitate motivation, assimilation of information, behavioural regulation and well-being are competence, the knowledge that you can deal with your environment, autonomy, that you have control of your direction and choices, even if it's supported autonomy, and relatedness, that you have meaningful connections with others. Um, as a theory of motivation, a de deficit in one of these psychological needs motivates discrepancy reduction efforts. So, for example, a lack of connection, relatedness, can motivate people to try to create connections. Yet, if you've got satisfactory connections, you're actually not going to be motivated to try and get more. Finally, as a theory of motivation and applying the theory to education, it is important to recognise that whilst the theory suggests that intrinsic motivation is the gold standard you're aiming for in motivating behaviour, in reality, the full range of human motivation exists, and thus any curriculum design should recognise the importance of supporting the development of relatedness in order to engage and transition extrinsically motivated learners to become intrinsically motivated learners. So, Another way to talk about this intr intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is to talk about a person's values. A person's values, which is simply what is important to them. Some people cringe at the thought of the values as a term. I think it gets thrown away around in weird contexts nowadays. Is an important function of the nature of the motivation. While competence, autonomy and relatedness explains the what of a human's basic psychological needs, your values and feeling that you have the competence, autonomy and relatedness in order to pursue these values provides the why. So, um, I haven't actually even introduced myself in terms of, I am with um, the ANU College of Law. What I am talking about, the research I'm talking about is about law students. I haven't deliberately related it to law at this point because I think some of the things here doesn't have, they're not bounded by subject matter. But what, um, the reason why I got involved in this and the, the looking at this was that studies of lawyers and law students by uh, Krieger and Sheldon in the US have suggested that in keeping with the theory proposed by Ryan and Decky, negative outcomes in well-being and professionalism in law students are associated with the undermining of these self-determination theory factors in law school. So furthermore, when it is undermined, 
there is the corresponding shift from intrinsic to extrinsic values, and this shift does not does not not only doesn't further the person's well-being, but it actually undermines the ethical professionalism of the profession, the legal profession as well. So in Australia um, and here at ANU. Um, empirical research conducted by my colleague Stephen Tang and I here on several cohorts of our professional practice course students in 2012 and 2013, which is a little while ago now, <laughs> um, reinforces the conclusions of Krieger and Sheldon's work by confirming this relationship between self-determination factors and well-being. However, the exciting part of our research was that we were able to demonstrate the effects of improving these self-determination factors through the curriculum. Essentially, all the US studies were looking at it from the point of view that there was negative well-being outcomes happening at law school and that there was the undermining of these factors that was doing it. The exciting thing that our study showed was that over the particular course we were looking at, we were actually um, either seeing in statistically significant increases in relatedness, competence, professional identity, and there was a stability and autonomy from a high starting base. And that was looking at the students from at the beginning of their 18-week course to the end of their 18-week course. And this is the core course within the Graduate Diploma in Legal Practice. Um, and that this, these increases or stability in relatedness, competence and autonomy correlates with a lack of statistically significant increase in depression, anxiety and stress symptoms in those students, same students. So in other words, during the period of the study, we appear to either reverse or at least stabilise, I'm not going to put too high a claim on it, the trends in law student wellbeing that were being reported elsewhere. Most notably, our modelling of what predicted overall levels of distress in our cohorts demonstrated that it is values obstruction that significantly predict, predicts more psychological distress in students, while increases in autonomy and relatedness in particular are predictors of less psychological distress in students. Now, we also looked at subjective well-being, which is a different, um, different scale to be looking at as well. And whilst we don't say subjective, well, we know, according to the, our research, that subjective well-being is not immediately the inverse of psychological distress, we were still able to determine that the strongest predictors of subjective well-being were also subjective autonomy and relatedness. So these results, which focused on values, autonomy and relatedness for good psychological results, results does mean I'll miss out on one critical element. That is competence. It's not featured largely in the positive results that we're seeing. So subjective feelings of competence is not a driver for well-being and professionalism in the same way that autonomy and relatedness is. And it does lead us to question what law school, and probably what most tertiary education, should be reinforcing in order to ensure better well-being outcomes. That is, is the emphasis on competence through exam results, which unfortunately still is largely in place, <coughs> misplaced when autonomy and relatedness are important for professional well-being? And then there is also the other thing. Who cares about well-being, <laughs> okay, if we're getting the results we want in outcomes? Beyond questions of whether it's ethical to do harm to your students through education, do students get better education, educational outcomes if they are well? It seems obvious to me the answer should be yes, but let's have a look at it. As part of our research, we've also had the positive findings and correlations between self-determination theory and values, and students' self-reported increases in professionalism, ethical outlook, professional identity, and even self-reported increases in what they know and will know upon admission to practice. Um, there's another interesting thing here I haven't emphasised in my notes on this, which is that they also feel that they're going to, their unknowns have increased from, from beginning to end of the course as well. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. I think it's a recognition that um, you've still got more to know. So let's look quickly at the features of the curriculum design in place at the professional practice core in the course at the time it was being run in 2012-2013 that may have contributed to these positive results. First of all, it's important to consider where the course fits in the life of the student. The Graduate Diploma of Legal Practice is their final hurdle students must complete after their undergraduate law degrees in order to be admitted to practice. 
Thus the focus of the teaching is already on practical legal skills. So teaching in context. So the positive results may not be surprising when we consider that even in Krieger and, Sheld Krieger and Sheldon studies in the US, they found that there was better autonomy support in those provided by those in the non-traditional law schools, the ones that focused on practical legal skills. Um, and that this correlated with better wellbeing outcomes. So we, I mean, we could just stop the analysis there, go, it's because it's practical legal education that we've got these results, but sorry, you're not that lucky. Um, basically, I think there are probably other things we should be looking at. Because under the title of practical legal training, it can involve a whole lot of different pedagogies. So let's just look at the PPC as a simulated collaborative legal environment, um, which was based on meeting client needs rather than the tra traditional exam structures. And it changed many of the dynamics prevalent in traditional legal education. So the first dynamic that changed the professional practice core was that we took the silo subjects and put them all in the core subject and put them all into one course. Now there were some disasters in that that you can always ask me about um, at lunch and I will tell you. But there's some good things about that as well. So it became an integrated course where instead of looking at the various different legal um, uh, practice areas separately, the idea was that they'd be looking at them together. The other dynamic that changed was that the student-teacher relationship was changed as the client, rather than the teacher, became the focus of student efforts. The hierarchical teacher-tutor roles were replaced with mentoring relationships. Mentors provided quick feedback and guidance to support students' autonomy to professionally develop and seek their own competence, but they did not provide numerical grades. Critical to this changing dynamic is that assessment was integrated into the transaction, not as a separate examination, as a function of meeting the client's needs. And mentor feedback was geared towards helping students to re-edit their work, keep doing it, until you get to competence. Um, they literally had to re-hand their work in until they reached the competence standard. Furthermore, the assessment was not based on heavily controlled scenarios with model answers attached but rather required students to engage with the simulated tasks with a creative problem-solving mindset. In other words, we used to call it a very messy learning environment. Teacher and student thus became mentor and mentee, and this autonomy-supportive environment provided students with in intrinsic motivation to do their best for the client and themselves, rather than aiming towards an arbitrary and sometimes an extrinsically motivated numerical grade. Another dynamic that changed was the relationship between students. Uh, there was no bell curve moderation of exam grades. It was open for every student to achieve competence or higher without reference to anyone else's achievements. The individual competition, an obvious, um, well, often debilitating obsession with grades that I see in other areas of legal education, was therefore intentionally removed in order to empower students to feel complete control over and acknowledge for the results they received. If they did badly, it was completely on their own head, nothing to do with scaling. Combined with the supported teamwork environment through which the students completed most formative transactional work and employment of practicing lawyers as mentors, at the height of the program when we had 2,000 students, we had 150 legal practitioners on our books as mentors that were directly mentoring these students which has its, also has its own fun attached to it. You can talk to me about that at lunch as well. Um, and the employer practicing lawyers as mentors. The PPC provided the environment for students to build relatedness with each other and the profession. And it would seem that this teamwork and relationship building is a fundamental component of the success in building relatedness through the course. Um, so maybe through this building of relatedness, we were able to you know, regain some of that intrinsic motivation that they may or may not have lost um, through their other parts of their degree. Um, and finally, rather than promoting values through sort of a hidden curriculum of stereotype perpetuation, lecture endorsement of what they think is right, we were looking at, they were actually discussing their own personal values explicitly and at various times throughout the course with their mentors and with their students. Um, and they also had the opportunity to practice how they would speak up about those values through the Giving Voice to Values curriculum. Um, so basically, in summary, oh, I haven't got enough time to do the summary, good, okay. Um, the PPC's messy integrated learning environment and curriculum 
is most likely to have, and I can't say absolutely, okay, to have been supported, uh, so supported self-determination theory and values development by having the supported autonomy through practice mentoring of individuals, teams by legal practitioners, encouraging competency development for the next steps in students' careers beyond the academy by refocusing assessment on building competency by responding con constructively to the uncertainties of practice and learning from mistakes, and then this development of relatedness through discovering and leveraging the diversity of experiences and skills with the team, within the team group work in order to meet a client's needs, um, and explicitly providing students with the ability to ethically enact their values through identification of those values and then practicing how to imply those values and ethics to concrete examples from practice. So thank you very much. Please wrap up now. Uh, it's been very long, so thank you for leading it. I thought I was going to give it a test out when you gave me my five minute warning, but sorry if I was speaking fast there at the end, everyone. So, thank you for um, giving us a very clear framing of curriculum through self determination theory and then giving some very specific examples of curriculum design there. I'm sure there are some questions in the audience that people are sitting on, naturally. So one problem I tend to come up with sometimes with students when we ask them to be a bit more autonomous is the pushback to just give me what I need to know and give me an exam because that's easy. Mm. How do students program change? Okay, so you have to do an expectations um, exercise definitely at the beginning of the course and it's something we didn't always do very well at the very beginning. We got better at it and we used our mentors to do that. They'd have sessions with the students to explain it through. The other thing about this just give me the answer, um, you do have to change. You know, um, We're getting them graduate diploma, they've done They've successfully navigated law school and whatever, and whatever other degree they've done. So yeah, they know how to get the work that they need to get through the assessments. Um, two things, we got rid of numerical grades. Um, it took a bit of doing. Um, but um, getting rid of the numerical grades, and we have just a not yet competent, competent, higher level performance. And frankly, I'd love to get rid of higher level performance as well, because it then leads to this kind of, but it's a, it's a two, I can see the argument both sides. You want to recognize those people who are really hitting well and truly above. Um, but um, so by getting rid of the exam structure, getting rid of the assessment structure that reinforces that I just want to have the information from you so I can pass the exam is a fundamental carrot that you can, you can use to change that, I think. Um, I often see um, assessment, I, uh, another paper I looked at years ago, which was that assessment really is going to make or break your curriculum. You can do the most amazing things to your curriculum, but if your assessment is just the same 100% exam or even 50% exam at the end that they want to get just the information, what's in the exam that they have to answer at. It'll break everything else beautifully that you've put into the curriculum because ultimately the smart ones will realise that they just need to get the information for the exam to get passed. So, yeah. Because I've had that. Redo your assessment. You know, if you didn't do well, go. And I think I had 2% of students actually bother to redo their assessment to do better. Yeah. Well, we didn't give them the option. Uh, they had to redo their assessment until they hit competent. And I often used to say to them, competent's not just 50%. We're, you know, we're sending you out to practice after this. After this, um, you know, your first day on the job, we want to be mildly <laughs> confident that you're not going to destroy somebody's life on the first day. So, I mean, that's a weird kind of thing. But 75% is what I usually try. When you, I try not to put it to that, but you said I've got to hit 75% to be confident. Potentially a very property statement you made a moment ago. Um, <laughs> curriculum is the assessment. I think that's something like that. Yeah. Like, I've, I've said that. There's one other question. If anybody has one. I come out with things like that sometimes. <laughs> you, you had 100 and something um, professionals. The illegal practitioners. <laughs> legal. Um, how many people did you need to wrangle? Um, we had, um, so we, we kept the convener structure, so the conveners who had their courses sort of into this, this man. We had eight conveners and they wrangled their section. <laughs> so it'd be 30, 35 legal practitioners, perfect convener. That was literally one of our biggest problems 
early on, we, we got it down to a more refined art over time, was how to recruit the right people to do these roles. Um, very early on, some of them took on, because they, they had the role of senior partner in the thing, and they could be really nasty um, to students. And we had to quietly, <laughs> Vivian's quietly, <laughs> we had to quietly encourage people to take a positive approach to how they were providing the feedback to students. So um, it's now the version of expectations management. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then consistency in what those expectations were across the board. It was, it, it was a big problem. We don't have the same. Thank you, Thank you.